Chapter 3, Electronic Structure and Periodic Properties of Elements. Let's first begin with a discussion about waves. So what is a wave? Everyone watching this is familiar with the concept of a wave, but I just want to describe it scientifically. We will define a wave as an oscillation or periodic movement that can transfer energy from one point in space to another. Now the kin kinetic energy is transferred through matter, but the matter itself remains in place. Now I do want to mention not all waves necessarily have to travel through matter. For example, light in space is traveling through a vacuum. Now think about shaking a rope, for example, when you grab a rope from one end and you start shaking it, it moves up and down and it creates a wave-like pattern. So it's not that the rope itself is moving from one point to another, rather it is transferring energy. Now into section 3.1, electromagnetic energy. There are three key terms here that you need to know. First is wavelength. Wavelength is represented by the variable lambda. This is the Greek letter lambda. It's this upside down cursive Y. Wavelength is defined as the distance between successive waves. So typically you'll see it measured from peak to peak. So this would be the wavelength of this first wave right here. The second term is frequency. Frequency uses the variable nu. So this is the Greek letter nu, N-U. It basically just looks like a curvy V. And frequency is defined as how often a new wave arrives at a point. So for example, typically we're describing frequency with how often it arrives at a new point per second. So if this wave in one second passes from this point to this point, so three cycles pass through in, or in one second, this wave right here would have a frequency of three hertz. Next, we've got the second wave right here. Now you'll notice this one has a much smaller wavelength. It is a wavelength that is about half the size of the first wave. So this has six cycles per second, or six hertz. This one, with an even smaller wavelength, it's got an even higher frequency. So you're beginning to see a relationship here. The final term is A, amplitude. So amplitude is represented by capital letter A. Now this is the least important of the three terms. You're gonna see the first two much more often. And amplitude is the height of wave from midline to peak or trough. Now here, you'll just see this wave right here has a low amplitude, whereas this wave has a high amplitude. All right, now let's look at the relationship of wavelength and frequency. So as you began to notice on the previous slide there, wavelength and frequency, they are inversely proportional. When one gets small, the other gets large. So if you have a very, very short wavelength, you'll have a very high frequency. If you have a long wavelength, that wave has a very small frequency. So they are inversely proportional to one another. They are also related through this equation. C equals lambda nu. C represents the speed of light, which we will define as 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. Now, anytime you use this equation mathematically, lambda must be in meters to cancel out with the meters in speed of light. So if you're using this equation, lambda must be in meters. Pay attention to your units here. Nu is in inverse seconds. So sometimes it's written as S to the negative one. Sometimes it's written as division sign S. And inverse seconds is also the same thing as hertz. So hertz and inverse seconds represent the same unit with respect to frequency. All right, let's take a look at the electromagnetic spectrum. So the electromagnetic spectrum is the representation of all the different types of electromagnetic, electromagnetic radiation sorted by their wavelength values. So down here on the left end is where we have short wavelengths. So these are types of electromagnetic radiation that have high frequencies and are very high energy. Whereas here on the right side, these types of electromagnetic radiation have much longer wavelengths, so they have lower frequencies and they are a bit lower energy. Visible light falls right here in the 300, 350 to 700 nanometer range. So a pretty narrow range of light that we are able to see. The rest of this light is all invisible to our eyes, but it is there. All right, now let's take a look at a mathematic example, a quantitative example. How would you be asked to use this type, this equation to solve for wavelength to solve for frequency, for example? This, a question, this question asks, what is the wavelength of light in nanometers 
that has a frequency of 7.29 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds. So here again, you'll be using C equals lambda nu. So C is a constant, it's the speed of light. That value will be on the reference sheet. Lambda is wavelength, that is what we're being asked to solve for here, and then we are given frequency. So first I would take this equation and solve it for lambda. So I get lambda equals C divided by nu. Now I can go ahead and plug my values in. So 2.998 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, 7.29 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds. So you should see here that the seconds on top and the inverse seconds on the bottom cancels, leaving our only unit as meters. So when we do this calculation, we get 4.12 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. So you could be done here, but notice that I did ask, what is the wavelength of light in nanometers? So you're gonna to wanna to take that value and convert to nanometers and you get 412. So the correct answer here would be 412 nanometers. Let's try a knowledge check question. What is the frequency of light with a wavelength of 366 nanometers, where C equals 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. All right, the correct answer is D, 8.20 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds. So remember, we've got C equals lambda nu. So we're solving for frequency here. So frequency equals C divided by lambda. So nu equals 2.998 times 10 to the eighth meters per second. And on the bottom, you would want to take that wavelength, make sure you put that wavelength into meters. So when you put that into meters, it should be 3.66 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. Plug this into your calculator and you get D, 8.20 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds. So just pay attention to your units here, but otherwise, pretty straightforward problem. All right, let's briefly talk about interference patterns. So this will come up a little bit later in this chapter and especially in chapter five when we get to molecular orbital theory. So interference patterns. So right here, th this shows some interference patterns where two different light sources were shined in an intersecting direction. So we get, you know, these a little bit beams here or these little slits of light that are much brighter. And then we have some areas that are darker and we have some areas where there's no light at all. So what's causing this? Well, it's an interference pattern between two different sources of light. If the light, the two sources of light are in phase with one another, that is if they, their two waves line up, so they both have peaks in the same spot, they both, both have these dips in the same spot, this is, can, causes constructive interference. So when these two waves interact with one another, they constructively interfere since they are in phase, which means they basically just add on to one another. So you get just a bigger wave. So that's where you would have these bright spots. This is caused by constructive interference. Now, if these waves are out of phase with one another, so for example, if there's a dip where the other one has a peak and vice versa, when they interfere and collide, they destructively interfere. Essentially, they cancel each other out, which leaves no resulting wave. That's where you see these dark spots. These are caused by destructive interference. All right, now let's talk a little bit about something a little bit different. We're gonna talk about black body radiation. So black body radiation is a concept in physics. So here we're describing a black body as a convenient ideal emitter that approximates the behavior of many materials when heated. So think about when you observe an oven, right? Those coils in your oven, they're that dark black color. They're a black body, which means they absorb all types of radiation equally. And so when they are heated, they emit radiation at every frequency and they emit radiation equally in every direction. So we're just imagining some sort of black body that absorbs all uh, frequencies of radiation equally and then it emits all frequencies of radiation equally um, at every frequency and it will change as it's heated. So what we notice here is that when this body is heated, Right, so here at 2500 Kelvin, this is what the distribution of light emitted looks like when it's at 3400 Kelvin. This is what its frequency, uh, the distribution looks like 4400, 5500. So you notice that as we heat this object up, the radiation that it emits is shifting, right? It's shifting to shorter and shorter 
wavelengths. It's getting closer and closer to the UV range. So the maximum wavelength or the lambda max, the wavelength of maximum emission shifts to shorter wavelengths as the temperature increases. So this is like metal becoming white hot as it increases in temperature or stars, they actually become bluer as they heat up. So something that is interesting about stars is, let me pause the video real quick, is that stars that are much hotter, so the hottest stars are actually blue, whereas stars that are cooler are more red. And then what's also interesting is there are no green stars. So as the temperature of the star shifts, so you're going to notice here that the temperature is going to shift and this causes the emission pattern to shift. So at very high temperatures, the emission pattern shifts way to the left, which means we get a lot more blue radiation being emitted, which causes the star to be blue. As the star or as the temperature of the star decreases, this emission pattern shifts to the right. It shifts more towards the red, and so the star gets more of an orangey red color. Since green is right in the middle, at no point is green ever the predominant color. Stars essentially shift from a red orange type color to a blue color. And so you will obs uh, observe that here in this animation. Okay, so pretty interesting stuff, and it's a good example of what happens and how the emission frequency changes depending upon the heat of the object. Now, back when uh, classical physics was still being you know, figured out in the 1800s, early 1900s, when blackbody radiation was proposed, there was a major problem. So classical theory, which treated everything as waves, it does not have the intensity dropping off in the UV region. So this is what our theories today predict, and this is a good approximation of the real behavior, where you get this huge spike and then a bit of a drop off in the UV range. There's not a lot of light emitted in the UV range. But classical theory thought that it would just spike infinitely as the object heated up, and as you got closer towards the visible and UV range, you would just see this massive, almost infinite spike in the radiation emitted. And so obviously, this is a big problem. And so it was discovered this is because classical theory allowed for vibrating atoms to have energy values from a continuous set, essentially from an infinite set. But Max Planck finally solved this issue in 1900. He discovered that the models only matched the observed behavior if we assume that energy is released in discrete packets with quantized energy, photons. So this prompted the discovery of photons. So we now know that light is not just a wave, it is also a particle. And these particles come in the form of photons. So this is where Planck's constant come from, which we're gonna learn about here on this slide. So one of the next things they looked at was what's called the photoelectric effect. And so this is the effect where when you shine a light at an object, typically we're shining light at metal here, we want to observe if electrons are ejected from the metal surface. Now light that meets certain energy and frequency requirements can eject electrons from the metal surface. So what matters is the frequency or the, wave, the wavelength of the light that you're pointing at the surface. So if I took a 700 nanometer light, for example, so maybe a red laser pointer, and I shined it at the surface of the metal, no electrons would be ejected because this red light here, it has a pretty long wavelength, which means it has a pretty small frequency. So it's low energy light. And so it does not have sufficient energy to cause an ejection of electrons from the surface. But if I use a green laser pointer, this has a shorter wavelength, which means it is more energetic light and so thus it is capable of ejecting electrons from the surface. Now the intensity or brightness of the light used affects how many electrons get ejected and depends on the number of photons, not the amplitude of the incoming wave. So this indicates that light can act like particles called photons. These photons have energy. Now the energy of photons depends on the frequency. And so this is our second important equation. E equals H nu. E is energy. H is Planck's constant, which is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules seconds. And again, nu is frequency. So this equation, like the first one, 
will also be on the reference sheet, but you need to know how to use this equation. And again, make sure you're paying attention to your units. So let's look at an example. What is the energy of a photon with a frequency of 6.00 times 10 to the 12th inverse seconds? So here you are being asked to solve for the energy. H is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th. And you are given the frequency, 6.00 times 10 to the 12th. So you just plug these values in and you solve and you would get 3.98 times 10 to the negative 21st joules. So that is the energy of a single photon with a frequency of 6.00 times 10 to the second. All right, now let's look at a type of problem you may be asked where you need to use both equations. So you should notice both of these equations involve frequency. So if we can solve for frequency in one of the equations, we can plug that in into the other equation. And remember C and H are constants. And remember that units for lambda must be in meters. So let's look at an example. What is the energy of light that has a wavelength of 494 nanometers, where H equals 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th, and C equals 2.998 times 10 to the eighth? So C equals lambda nu, that's our first equation, and E equals H nu, that's our second equation. Remember that lambda must be in meters. So there are two ways to do this. So I'm gonna show you the way where you take the wavelength and you solve for the frequency, and then you plug that in and solve for the energy. So we've got 494 nanometers, that's our wavelength. We need to convert that to meters. So that would be 4.94 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. Now I'm gonna take 4.94 times 10 to the negative seventh, and I'm gonna plug it in my first equation to solve for the frequency. So C is 2.998 times 10 to the eighth. Lambda is that wavelength we just found right there, and this gives us the frequency of 6.0729 times 10 to the 14th inverse seconds. Now I'll take that frequency and I'll plug it into my second equation. So I'll plug in Planck's constant, plug in that frequency, and I get an energy value of 4.03 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. So that is the answer to this question. Now this is one way to do it where you just do it two steps at a time. The second way to do it was what I mentioned on the previous slide where you solve one of these equations for frequency and then you plug those variables in into the other equation. All right, let's try a knowledge check question. What is the wavelength of light that has an energy of 2.87 times 10 to the negative 21st joules? All right, the correct answer here is B, 6.93 times 10 to the fourth nanometers. So we've got two equations, C equals lambda nu and E equals H nu. So I'm gonna take this equation right here and I'm gonna solve it for frequency. So frequency equals C over lambda. So now I can take this and I can plug it in right here. So I get E equals H times C over lambda. So you're gonna to wanna to use that second equation and I'm gonna again, just gonna do a little rearranging here since the question asks for wavelength. So I'm gonna get wavelength equals H times C divided by E. So I would wanna use this equation right here. Now you plug in H for Planck's constant, plug in C for the speed of light and plug in this value right here for E energy. And this will give you an answer in meters. So I believe this would give you the answer uh, price 6.0. 93 times 10 to the negative fifth meters. When converted to nanometers, you get 6.93 times 10 to the fourth. So B is the correct answer here. All right, last thing in this section, I wanna briefly talk about line spectra. So line spectra, these are essentially emission spectra that are given off by elements. So if you take hydrogen and you heat it up, you would get this emission spectra where hydrogen emits four lines at precise wavelengths. Sodium's emission spectra looks like this. It emits uh, what, seven lines at these specific and discrete wavelengths. Here we've got the emission spectra for calcium, the emission spectra for mercury. So you should notice they are all emitting individual discrete lines. They don't emit, emit a range of pattern like a black body does. And so there is a reason for this.
which we will learn about in section 3.2. So I'll see you in the next video. That concludes section 3.1.